<clears throat> Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. This is Paul Sutter, and coming up, we're talking about star hopping across the galaxy and, of course, taking listener questions about all things in this universe. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern, and you can follow along online or leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com. And in today's Blue Shift, I'll be talking about humans in space, 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 space. space. I'm sure Greg can actually add a sound effect to that, or not. Maybe I did a good enough job, but first, the news. Hello, space cadets. Welcome to Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Ohio State and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent of the stars. Got an exciting show for you today where we talk about all things space, astronomy, astrophysics, rocketry. If it's above the Earth's atmosphere, it's in this show's universe. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern here at Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail at Space Radio Show dot com to get yourself on the air you can also follow along with our space cadets on our live streams on youtube and twitch check out space radio show.com for the links space cadets tuning in live roll call from the pava slovenia london uk dublin ireland rio de janeiro brazil denver just denver Bucharest, Romania, Pell City, Alabama, and Orange County, California. And coming in at the last minute, hi from Chile. Ooh, what part of Chile? Because we're going back to Chile for an Astro Tour, but more about that later. <sighs> Seriously, folks, I've only prepped 10 minutes at your material tops. So get those questions in. Oh, how we doing, Space Cadets? Is it a good day for you? It's a good day for me. Every day is a good day to have you, space cadets, in my life. You want to talk about SpaceX? You want to talk about rockets and stuff? Me too. Before I start taking calls, I wanted to share some interesting bits of news I caught recently. And hey, who wants to talk about rockets not making it up into space, but not in a bad way, okay? Because sometimes we try to send rockets up into space and they blow up or they crash and it's sad. But sometimes we intentionally don't want to send rockets all the way up into space because we're just testing things. And there was a big test recently by SpaceX, the private spaceflight company. They're building a new giant rocket. I, you gotta give credit to Elon Musk, the guy who runs SpaceX, for a flair for naming things. The name of his next generation big giant rocket is simply Starship. That's it. That's it. Just Starship. But Starship isn't built yet. They're still working on it. So instead, what they're doing is testing the engine for it. And of course, in rocketry, the engines themselves have names because reasons. So it's a Raptor engine that's going to drive the Starship. You with me so far? Good. Now... The whole Starship isn't done yet, but the, they are ha, they have designed and built the Raptor engine, and so they put that in something called the Star Hopper, which isn't as amazing as it sounds because that name sounds like it's going to hop across the galaxy and even be better than a ship. Man, you could just hop to a star. When why would you want a ship to a star when you could hop to a star? No. What this does is it goes up, launches, gets uh, pretty high, like 150 meters high, and then lands back where it started. The point of these demonstrations are to test to make sure that this new engine can take off, that it can land, and they can do all the things that SpaceX needs to do. And also, it's a PR move. You know, it's a cool, rockety thing that's blasting off in the desert and then landing back down. And that looks pretty awesome. On the other side of the spectrum, we have NASA with the Space Launch System, which is a big bad giant rocket too not the reusable kind nasa don't play those games just spacex and just the private companies 
NASA has developed uh, some of the technologies needed for the space launch system. They've developed a mock-up that's going to go inside of a testing facility to make sure that the testing facility works. That's right. They are testing the test. You know what? If you got to test something, you might as well double test it. Test the test. Okay, fine. You know what, NASA, you be you. I don't care that you've been doing this for like a decade and you've already spent $14 billion on it. And SpaceX has been working on this new engine since last December. And they already have, you know, some controlled situation. You know, okay, you know what? I'm not going to rag on NASA too much. Love NASA, doing lots of great work. But really when it comes to the next generation of spaceflight, it's hard not to be excited by the private sector, especially SpaceX. Because look, they're doing stuff like every few months. Like, okay, here's a new thing. Every few months, okay, here another few months goes by. Okay, here's a new thing. Here's a new thing. Here's a new thing. They're like hitting progress really fast. And that's hard to not be excited about. That's the news for today. Remember, you can leave a voicemail or follow along at spaceradioshow.com. I think it's time to have a conversation. Yes, unbiased sports. I will raise a glass of vitamin water to you. In salute. Really appreciate that. <sighs> I think the usual, usual setup here, folks, I'm going to do a couple voicemails for the first segment, and then we'll do some Space Cadet questions. <sighs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm just having a good day. How you guys feeling? I know I asked. Adam Synergy, how's it going? Yakov. Tommy, Andy, Niji, sure. Any gravity nonsense, that's for sure. Astro B. All right, let's 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 do some questions. We've got some voicemails ready to go. Man, we've got a lot. Greg, why don't you pick a juicy one and play the tape? Hi, my name is Hunter, and I would like to know what would happen if one void went another void. Oh, oh! Did did I just get a question about voids? Now this is not planned. That is not a plant. This was not prearranged. It just so happens I I love voids. The nothing, the big expanses of nothing in our universe. It's actually one of the areas of expertise of my research. I am proud to say that I personally am one of the top five people in the world who have studied voids because there are only five people in the world who have studied voids. And so, hey, I'm going to take a prize when I can get it. Voids are the vast, empty regions in our universe. They're big. They're big. They're like tens of millions of light years across. They are one of the largest pieces of the cosmic web. They're not entirely empty. They, there are some scattering of dim dwarf galaxies, you know, dusted through them very, very thinly, but they are largely empty. And yes, voids grow with time. A long time ago, the cosmic voids were much smaller, and now they are much bigger. And they get that way through two ways. One, from just expanding. The cosmic voids, the bubbles in the cosmic web, get bigger with time, and they merge together. There can be a very thick wall of galaxies between two cosmic voids, and over time, that thick wall will get thinner and thinner and thinner and stretch out and stretch out and stretch out, and then separate. And the voids, it looks like uh, we've studied this in simulations. We have not seen this in the real universe because the real universe, these kinds of processes take billions of years so we haven't been watching long enough we need another you know billion years or so but we have watched this process play out in simulations of the growth of structure in our universe the large scale structure in our universe and we see voids growing up next to each other the walls between them getting thin and then it's like they kiss there's a little point where they merge together and then that gap grows and grows and grows and grows and then before you know it 
they've fully merged together and you have a single large void. Now this can happen between voids of similar sizes. Sometimes there are cases where there's a big void and then there's a bunch of little voids embedded in the walls around a big void. And then as the walls thin out, those little voids get gobbled up by the big monster in between. Sometimes there's major mergers of voids. It's a very, very interesting process. I actually wrote a whole paper on the a merger history of voids where we tracked over 13 billion years of cosmic evolution how voids merge together what were the conclusions of that paper i don't remember because it was several years ago but it's there it's part of the scientific body of knowledge right <laughs> we got time for another question greg hit me up Hi, I'm Declan, and I would like to know what a solar flare is. Ooh, Mr. Declan, great question, solar flare. So, I got a question for you. Have you ever barfed? I'm going to guess yes. A solar flare is what happens when the sun barfs. Around the surface of the sun, the surface of the sun itself is crazy complex. There's, there's massive fountains of plasma rising and sinking. There are all these twisted magnetic fields. And sometimes the twisted magnetic fields get so twisted together that they just snap. And they just lose it. And they release a ton of energy. And that lifts a big chunk of material out of the surface of the sun. Now, when this snap happens, when the magnetic fields get too, too, tense and they just they just snap it releases this massive burst of energy called a solar flare that we can see it's like a flash like it's a massive flash and sometimes the solar flare which is the big flash that we see on the surface is accompanied by this massive release of material of plasma of sun guts itself that come racing through the solar system. When that happens, we call it a coronal mass ejection. Not every solar flare always leads to a coronal, coronal mass ejection, but they're usually linked together and they're caused by the same thing. So next time you hear the phrase solar flare, just know the sun is barfing. Two awesome questions from Hunter and Declan today. I'm going to take a quick break, but don't forget to leave a voicemail so you can join the conversation or you can join the Space Cadets over on the live streams on YouTube and Twitch. Go to spaceradioshow.com for the button to leave a voicemail and the links to the live streams. I'm Paul Sutter. This is Space Radio, and this show is brought to you by you. Go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to learn how you can keep this show going. I mean it. I mean it. It's up to you. See you after the break. Those were super fun questions. Thank you, Hunter and Declan. I sincerely hope you had parental permission to call this radio show. All right, so many Space Cadet questions. On Bias Boards, I'll get to your question. And it's your first time. Welcome, everyone. Uh, any first timers here? Welcome to all of you. Holographic principle, Planck length, electric planes, moon spin, anti retrograde. What happens to quantum reality? Cool worlds. Uh, sorry, uh, nitty gravity, anti gravity nonsense. That's your name. Uh, I did not watch uh, that that cool worlds video. I'm very very sorry. I don't I don't get out much. Mm, I'm just I'm I'm here. I'm writing, making videos. All right. You guys ready? So many questions. How do I do this? Should I, you guys, you guys choose. Um, should I do lightning round on this? Should I try to do as many questions as possible in nine minutes? I think I should. 
like 30 seconds per question. Like boom, boom, boom. I like knock them out. We need to stretch for this. Oh, I don't want to pull a muscle. Don't want to pull a brain muscle. Hydrate. Hydration is important for doing uh, lightning rounds. All right. We're going to do it. We're gonna, it's going to be nine minutes, and I ain't stopping for nothing. I mean it. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. We have so many Space Cadet questions lined up, ready to go, that I am going to do a lightning round. That's right. Oh, man, are you ready? I'm going to try to answer as many questions as possible. Keep Someone keep count. Ready? Go. Bomb Bomb on YouTube is asking, are globular clusters failed galaxies? We don't think they're failed galaxies. Globular clusters are these balls of stars that orbit larger galaxies. They appear old. They appear red. They appear mostly dead. As far as we can tell, they co-evolve with galaxies. We don't think that there were galaxies that were trying to get going on their own and then it failed in some sense. But other than that, we don't know exactly how they formed. Next, also Bob Bob, are we too optimistic in terms of human space travel in 50 years? Um, 50 years ago, we went to the moon and nothing else came close. Like... I actually agree. All the time estimates for going back to the moon, going back to Mars... I, I'm a little bit more pessimistic than average properly. I, I think we're going to end up on Mars. We're going to explore asteroids. We're going to do all that. It's going to take a lot longer than we expect because it is just a hard problem. John Kelly Brown. Can Paul discuss? That's me, Paul. The holographic principle, no matter how much research I do, I, can, I still can't wrap my head around it. Okay. Holographic principle principle mm. if you have a bunch if you have a problem you're trying to solve in three dimensions and it's a really sticky problem and you're having trouble you can map that problem like you can play some games with the mathematics to map it into two dimensions and some problems allow you to do this where you can do this mapping without losing any information. It's just, it's a mathematical game. It's a mathematical trick. Then in two dimensions, it becomes a completely different problem. And you might be able to solve, you might be able to hack through the mathematics in two dimensions and then import back into three dimensions. The holographic principle allows you to jump from three dimensions to two dimensions and back without losing any information in the process, which means you can solve the problem in two dimensions, bring it back to three. We are interested in the holographic principle as a possible way to approach quantum gravity, which as you might know, is a kind of challenging problem in three dimensions. Next question, if a Planck length is the smallest thing, how can singularities exist? Singularities are points of infinite density and they do not exist, but we don't know what's at the center of a black hole. Still working on that. Check back next Tuesday at the least. Liam is asking, Norway predicts that by 2040, commercial planes will be fully replaced by electric planes. Do I think there is a future of commercial electric powered spacecraft? Mm. You know, electric powered spacecraft is, it's a very challenging proposition because in space, you need to push off of something. You can't push off the air. You have to bring your propellant with you. You need not just an energy source in space, but you also need a fuel source. Now for rockets, these are the same thing. The same liquid that we use to make the thing have power is the exact same thing we squirt out the back to make a rocket. Now, there are electric space vehicles like ion engines where you just shoot some charged particles out your back end. And when you run out of charged particles, you can't go anymore, even though you have plenty of energy. These are solar powered craft. But actually storing energy inside of a battery like we're doing with cars 
that's really tough because just the energy density inside of a battery ain't that great. So, I mean, maybe someday, but mm, for a while, it's going to be, it's going to be gas. Unbiased Sports on YouTube is asking my first time. Hey, welcome aboard. Why do moon, some moons spin anti-retrograde, prograde, instead of retrograde with their planets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes, uh, all the planets in the solar system go in one direction around the sun. Not every planet orbits the same direction in, within the solar system. Things have been knocked around in the past. Most moons around a particular planet will orbit in the same direction, but some go the opposite direction. Why? Because they feel like it, man. All right. They're not going to take you. You're not their boss. They'll go prograde, they'll go retrograde, they'll go both if they feel like that's physically impossible. But obviously something happened. Either there was some major collision event in that particular moon's history, or it's a captured object that didn't form with the planet. It was just acquired later and then fell into this orbit. Nine Chimera, as space expands and pushes galaxies apart, what happens to the underlying quantum reality? Does it become attenuated or is it more continuously produced? As the universe expands, there's more empty space between the galaxies, which means there is more vacuum, which means whatever's happening inside the vacuum and including any quantum weirdness, you get more of, which is exactly how we think dark energy works, but that's a different show. Any gravity nonsense is asking, did you watch the last Cool Worlds video? And if I can talk about it, I did not. Sorry. Next, Deverly Solanke is asking, what might be the consequences if Big Bang Theory proves wrong? Well, Trust me, Big Bang Theory is on really solid ground. I mean, there are some hard, indisputable pieces of evidence. And if you want your own theory of the origins or early history of the universe, you still have to explain all the same pieces of evidence. The evidence doesn't go away. Whatever you might want to replace the Big Bang Theory with is going to look a lot like the Big Bang Theory because you just can't get away from the evidence. Nancy, if we have discovered how to exceed the speed of light, will we then be able to peek inside a black hole? We can't exceed the speed of light for just, so just forget about it. Michael Foley on YouTube, I'm going, I'm going. What do you think the, the James Webb Telescope teach us about the universe. The James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. It will tell us about the formation of stars or the formation of planets around stars in the galaxy. It will tell us about the first generation of galaxies to appear in the universe. And it will be a hunter of exoplanets, potentially being able to measure the atmospheres around exoplanets, looking for signs of life. George is asking if the universe is finite, how can it have a center? Can it have a center? The universe has no center, it has no edge, and yet it is finite. No, that doesn't make any sense at all, but too bad. Flip, oh, on YouTube, did you hear about Professor David Kipping's idea of using Earth's atmosphere as a lens or a telescope? Upload a video about using Jupiter's upper atmosphere for an interplanetary 5 megabits internet. Okay. Don't know too much about it. Our atmosphere can bend light. Also, gravity can bend light. You can potentially use that as a telescope. Don't know too much about it. Coffee KX on Twitch. Is it possible that we live inside a black hole? No. We do not. We live inside the universe. Black holes are very, very special creatures. Once you enter a black hole, you cannot stay at rest and you will reach the singularity in finite time. And we ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Thank you for all those amazing questions. We're almost out of time today on Space Radio. But before we go, I'm going to catch my breath. And then it's time for a blue shift. Wow, I did it. I did it. <sighs> Just give me a minute, guys. I really use my brain for that, and the brain uses 25% of the body's energy. Does that count as a workout? That counts, right? 
Thank you. 12. I reached 12. I think that's a new record, Nancy. I think 12 is a new record. Yay me. Hmm. Gonna throttle it back here, folks. We're gonna take it nice and slow for this blue shift. I'm Paul Sutter, and you're listening to Space Radio, and this is the blue shift, my opportunity to go a little bit closer to you. And just wanna take it easy for this blue shift. I wanna talk about people in space. Humans aren't really meant for space. They're not really meant for zero gravity environments. They're not really meant for low gravity environments. Our bodies start doing really weird things. Space is an incredibly challenging, harsh environment. Perhaps the most challenging environment we could possibly encounter. Space travel is risky. Space travel is difficult. Space travel is is fundamentally hard and so of course i'm enthusiastic and excited about the potential of us going back into space on a regular basis more than just monkeying around the international space station about exploring the moon about exploring mars about exploring asteroids but i temper that enthusiasm with a healthy dose of reality which is the reality is this is hard and the moon is ridiculously far away and Mars don't even get me started on Mars. These are hard things that are going to require tremendous technological and engineering achievements and ingenuity and hard work and money. It's not impossible and I hope we are able to accomplish some of these things at least in my lifetime. But in the meantime, I know how, how hard it's going to be. So I'm not going to sit around like, yeah, we're going to be in Mars in 20 years. I'm not going to point to some random fifth grader and say, you might be the first person on Mars because I don't want to get their hopes up falsely. Maybe I'm just a curmudgeon. I am a curmudgeon. But I'm an optimistic curmudgeon. Is that a valid combo? If not, I'm going to make it a combo. And speaking of not hard environments... Why don't you join us for an Astro Tour? We're doing a cruise of the Caribbean where we're going to do stargazing off the deck every single night. We're going to visit ancient mine ruins. The Mayans were nuts about astronomy, by the way. They love Venus. Tracked Venus very careful. They had super accurate calendars, more accurate than anyone else in the world. We're going to see some of their temple complexes that are astronomically significant. And we're going to take a tour of Space Center Houston and check out like Mission Control at Johnson Space Center, the old one and the new one. We're going to look at some really cool rockets. It's an amazing trip. It's August of 2020. You can register now by going to astro.tours. That's astro.tours. And unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by you. Go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to learn how you can keep this show going. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing, Nancy Graziano for wrangling the space cats, all the fine crew at WCBE Radio for making this show possible. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Visit spaceradioshow.com for more info, links to the live stream locations, and the episode archive. You can also follow me directly on all social channels at Paul Matt Sutter. And of course, thanks again, space cadets, for listening. See you next week, and remember... Science is for sharing. End of transmission. I am a Kraken. It's true, Astro B. It's true. I'm so glad you could watch Unbiased Sports. So cool when uh, Space Cadets are able to join live. And I hear you about Bob about a longer show. You know, I... It was like a year ago when we started working at WCBE on a longer show. That fell through for various reasons. One of the reasons is I don't live in Columbus anymore. Don't worry. Plans are afoot. 
to make the show longer. Just, just hold on, man. Patience. Patience is a beautiful thing, and you will learn it. <laughs> See you next week, everyone.